Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the live streaming worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. I'm Grace Price, a member of the worship committee, and I will be your worship associate today. We invite you to worship with us with an open mind and an open heart. As we enter into sacred time, created by our presence and shared intent, I invite you to get comfortable. Turn down your phones and other distracting devices. Make a conscious decision to set aside for this one hour, the self-protective walls we all keep around our heart and our thoughts. Let us remember and explore together what has drawn us to this faith or learn what this faith is about. and relax. Let the stresses of the outside world slip away as together we focus on this time together. And together we breathe. Although we are now a community connected largely by electronic means, one day we will be together again. Yet even now, we are those seekers with the yearnings to learn, to understand, to make the world a better place and with the same desire for fellowship. And so we are here seeking that living interconnected web of which we are a part. Let go of the anxiety, the fears, the expectations of your own or others making and join us in this hour of beloved community. And so together we breathe. Our opening hymn this morning is My Life Flows On in Endless Song. Please rise in spirit and join us. And because we are zooming this, nobody will know if you sing off key. Call to worship, 
please read with me one of our Unitarian Universalist Covenantal poems. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to live in harmony with all the living creatures and plants of the earth, this do we affirm. <clears throat> Today, Steve Fuji is our speaker, and the title of his talk is The Story of an American Family of Japanese Ancestry. About his talk, he said, this talk initiated with the idea of speaking about racism and how my ancestors and I have been affected by it. It's pretty pathetic to realize <clears throat> that racism still exists so strongly that this topic even needs to be addressed. However, with current events ranging from the attacks on Black people that made Black Lives Matter necessary, to the deportation of illegal Mexican immigrants while keeping their children in the custody of U.S. courts, to the violent attacks on Asian American people who are blamed for what a certain politician keeps referring to as the Chinese virus, it's clear that racism does still exist in full force. My family has been in this country as part of the American population for over a hundred years. In the early years, the immigrant generation retreated as second class citizens. My father's grandparents immigrated to Utah as railroad workers in the early 20th century. After the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, many Japanese began immigrating to replace the Chinese as railroad workers with low pay unsafe working conditions, segregation, and inhumane treatment. Japanese immigrants worked very hard to, as my grandfather put it, get a good position in life. But so much was taken away after the Pearl Harbor attack by Japan, when all persons of Japanese ancestry were forced to evacuate the West Coast. After World War II, because of the efforts of older generations to pick up the pieces upon returning home, I lived my childhood relatively free of racism in a neighborhood that was developed by Asian Americans as a little safe haven for them in Los Angeles. But by the time I was a teen and began pursuing acting roles, I learned that I would be limited to ethnic roles because I was not considered to be a regular American. Finally, there is the need for unity and understanding if humanity is to have a future. I thought of a song that has come to represent the hippie peace and love movement, but has a very strong message about unity. And I wanted to conclude by performing it as a special musical piece for the church service. I created a video using a recording of me singing the song and added relevant images. My skills as a video editor are pretty limited, so it's not a polished music video but I think it gets the point across. Steve Fuji was born and raised in the Los Angeles area, a fourth generation Japanese American from an LA based family. He spent many years working in various areas of the Hollywood film, television and record industries. While pursuing a career as a singer musician, he found more lucrative careers behind the scenes first as a record producer engineer, then as a film TV casting director. He also made some efforts as a film video producer, director and writer, and appeared as an actor on many television shows, such as Mama's Family, <coughs> Three's Company, and Different Strokes, as well as several low budget feature films. In 1998, he moved to the small town of Joshua Tree, and was active in the local theater and music scenes, working extensively with young talent and won several awards from the Desert Theater League. He moved to Riverside in 2011 and has focused his efforts on community building, spiritual ascension, and mentoring children. For those who are part of this live Zoom, Steve has agreed to stay after the end of the service for a short period of questions and answers. There are a few, few announcements we would like to share. 
During the service, we will mention several website and email addresses and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all this information so that you won't need to copy things down right now. However, for those needing the information by auditory means, they will be announced verbally during the service. Chat time provides an opportunity to spend an hour talking among ourselves, usually beginning with the service, then wandering on to other topics. It's held on Zoom at 11.30. But to participate, you need a separate Zoom invitation. So please go to our website at uuchurchofriverside.org for the Zoom chat time registration or email Lee Greer at president at uuchurchofriverside.org. The crises of 2020 demand a response to the central question of our time. How shall we live together? As people of faith and values, our response calls for a new moral vision a California where everyone, no matter our race or place, can truly belong and thrive. We also believe in mercy, second chances, and healing. Pledge to vote for these values in November. It's easy to make that pledge. On your cell, text SCFICUC to 40649 to find out how. For the most current and reliable information related to the COVID-19 virus for our area, go to the website for your county public health department or the state of California. You can find information and links on our website at uuchurchofriverside.org. Riverside County has recently moved into tier two of the governor's four tier steps toward reopening. That allows churches to reopen with accommodations. Our church leaders are discussing plans toward that eventuality, but we don't want to take steps that may be, need to be retracted if the numbers don't hold. So we will keep you updated on Sunday announcements and on the website. Dinah Rowe has resumed the monthly UUCR newsletter again. It will be out the first of every month. If you have something you would like covered or you want to write something for it, please let Dinah know at ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com or call her or text her at 909-645-2885. The church and some members and friends of UUCR have received several fraudulent emails, more again this week, asking for help. As an example, we received one email purporting to be from Lee, our board president. The return email was president.uuchurchofriverside0 at gmail.com. Please do not respond to any email asking for help, money, or gifts. You can contact the individual directly by phone, and please contact the church office for more information. If you have unknowingly responded and sent them something, please let us know immediately. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. And the second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. Let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the Maranga, the original people of this land, who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. In honor of the Maranga people, we, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together.
Our chalice lighting this morning is chalice lighting on inherent worth and dignity. We light this chalice to celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of every person. To reaffirm the historic pledge of liberal religion to seek that justice which transcends mere legality and moves toward the resolution of true equality. And to share that love which is ultimately beyond even our cherished reason, that love which unites us. Our next hymn is Spirit of Life. Please rise in spirit and join us. Joys and concerns. Sharing joys and concerns is an important part of belonging to this beloved community. On the first Sunday of each month, we will share with you the joys and concerns that we have received throughout the month. Please be sure to email or text your joys and concerns throughout the month to Dinah Rowe, our Caring Network Coordinator. Her email is ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com, or you can call or text her at 909-645-2885. There is a Swedish proverb that says, shared joy is a double joy. Shared sorrow is half sorrow, although the tradition is rooted in many societies. 
Throughout history, after battle, the warriors gathered around the campfire and talked about their wins, their losses, the valor they witnessed, the bravery. It helped them cope, survive. Today, critical incident debriefing techniques and many forms of therapy include a sharing of joys and concerns by whatever name. Joys, gratitudes, thankfulness, concerns, worries, mourning losses. On first Sundays, <clears throat> we place a symbolic stone in our water chalice for the joys and concerns we have shared and in recognition of those we hold close and have not shared. Concerns. Robert is concerned that Stephen will not get a fair shake in the Riverside court system and will get a lot of time whenever the case gets to court. His hope is for Stephen to come home soon or be sentenced to not more than four years. Tinka Friend emailed recently that her older sister, Janet Gilmore, died August 28th. In years past, Janet often attended our Sunday services with Tinka and briefly sang in the choir. Hal Markin has been a member of UUCR for many years. Hal had surgery in June as in a, as, and is in a course of chemotherapy right now. His chronic back problems continue. His address and phone number are in the church directory and a call or note would surely brighten his day. We place a symbolic stone in our water chalice for the concerns shared and in recognition of all those held close and not shared. Joyce. Hal Markin was a member of UUCR for many years. Hal and his wife live in Yukaipa, and we were concerned about how they were managing with the El Dorado wildfire raging in the Yukaipa Oak Glen areas. Hal reported that they had been on alert for possible evacuation, but thankfully had not had to leave their home. Robert and Denise Foster Wilson, who met and married at UUCR, moved to Lincoln City, Oregon this summer. Robert was co-chair with Bob Melsh of our Social Justice Committee for many years, and both he and Denise were active members of the Green Sanctuary and Caring Network committees. Their young adult grandson, Adrian, moved with them. They relayed some of their frightening experiences with Oregon's wildfires, but with good resolution. They slept in their clothes to be ready to evacuate, drove through burning areas to reach their motorhome, which was parked at a campground at a lake, only to be told the campground was under fire evacuation orders, and finally arrived with the motorhome in their car some miles south at Denise's sister's friend's home, where they waited out the fires for a few days. Ultimately, they learned their house escaped damage, and they were relieved to finally be back home. Kind of a combination of concerns giving way to joy. Like so many churches across the country, we have struggled since the closures in March. But we have been here since 1881, and we are still here. But we've only ever been here with the financial and volunteer support of you, our congregation, and our community. Thank you to everyone who has been able to help. It is said that joy shared is multiplied. We place a symbolic stone in our water chalice for the joys we have shared in all those we have not. And now Dinah Rowe, our church treasurer, will speak to us about sharing our treasure. Good morning. This portion of our service is how we fund all that we do to minister to and care for our congregation 
and our beloved historic church and to ensure that when we are able to safely reopen again, we will be here to welcome you all back. A reminder that even though the church is not allowed to reopen at this time, the church expenses continue. Just a few of these expenses which are ongoing are the utilities, insurance, and the security service. Our administrator, Robert, pays the bills and answers inquiries to the church plus other administrative duties as required. I, I have been in regular contact with our accountant. Laura has pointed out that the church income is down, so please make sure your pledge is current. You can email your pledge and donations to the church office, please no cash. Our church office is shown here and will be, show, will be available again later in the program. We have Stater Brothers cards for your grocery shopping that also earns a church, our church a percentage. Please contact me or the church office to purchase Stater Brothers cards. For those of you who have purchased Amazon gift cards, another way to help is when making purchases through Amazon, go to smile.amazon.com. Be sure to have the smile and choose Universalist Unitarian Church as, you, as your charity. We receive 0.5% of your quali qualifying purchases and by using an Amazon script card, we receive a purchase from a percentage from both. I will be taking orders for script cards again as the holidays approach. Gift cards make good gifts to put in your holiday cards. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity and to those who give of their time and their talent. Thank you for your generous care and attention. Our next hymn is from you I receive. Please rise again in spirit and join us. meditation, contemplation, and prayer. Our contemplative reading this morning is Community Means Strength. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned. We only catch glimpses from time to time. Community, Somewhere, there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere, a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength. That joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter a circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. Let us pause to share a moment of silence.
And now I have the pleasure of introducing Steve Fuji. Steve is a member of our church and has long been an active leader in our children's religious education program. Steve? Okay, good, I'm unmuted now. Good morning, everybody. I wish we could all be together in our beautiful church sanctuary, but I hope that this online service will be able to reach more people than an in-person service would have been able to. So Grace took a lot of words out of my mouth, and they actually were my words um, from the introduction that I had written, and that was pretty much everything that I had intended to speak about to introduce this, so I won't need to do that now. But inevitably, when people find out that I'm Japanese American, they always ask, was your family in camp during World War II? And yes, but there's a lot more to the story of the racism that Asian Americans have encountered than that going back many years. It's clear that this country on our founding fathers had intended for this to be the land of the free or white people. The Naturalization Act of 1790 only allowed white people who were not born here to apply for citizenship. People of color were excluded until 1870 when people of African descent were allowed to apply for citizenship. But of course, by 1870, most of the people of African descent who were in this country had been born here. This specifically excluded, though, people coming from other countries and um, was greatly targeting the Asian immigrants because in the mid-1800s, there was a large wave of immigration of people from China wanting to um, take advantage of the gold rush years and the opportunities that provided. And that led to being the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 that excluded Chinese from immigrating at which time a lot of people from Japan started immigrating until the, the Asian Im Exclusion Act of 1924 prevented people from any Asian countries to enter this country. And um, also that Naturalization Act of 1790 wasn't really over, overruled until the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 that allowed people of color to apply for citizenship. That meant that people from our neighboring over the border uh, countries of, um, of Mexico and Canada were not allowed to apply for citizenship either. Well, actually maybe white uh, people from Canada were if they were white. Anyway, my family's story on my father's side is a pretty typical kind of story. My grandmother's parents came over as railroad workers, replacing the Chinese railroad workers in the early 1900s. My grandmother was born in Japan in 1902 and came over as a little girl with them. They eventually ended up in Colorado and had more children there. Meanwhile, my grandfather was born in Japan in, 18, uh, in 1901 and immigrated at the age of 16 in 1917 to California, worked as a houseboy in San Francisco and a numerous other odd jobs until he ended up in Los Angeles in the early 1920s. And as was the tradition at that time, they were uh, had an arranged marriage between the two families that was considered beneficial for the families. And so... My grandmother was sent to California to marry my grandfather and they stayed in Los Angeles and raised a family. My uncle was the first born in 1926, my father in 1928 and my aunt in 1930. They lived in the neighborhood of Los Angeles that was a segregated Japanese ghetto. It was officially called Dayton Heights but was more commonly referred to as J Flats or Jap Flats, an area that was um, just south of the very affluent white neighborhood of Los Feliz in Los Angeles but one of the few areas where people of color actually were allowed to live in Los Angeles at that time. My grandfather struggled to make a living and provide for his family during those years. And then in 1941, December of 1941, Pearl Harbor attack occurred, leading to Executive Order 9066 in February of 1942, requiring that all people of Japanese ancestry be evacuated from the West Coast. Now they did this, feeling that people of Japanese ancestry were a threat to this country. But if you think about the fact that, for example, my mother was a six-year-old little girl born in Los Angeles, didn't speak any Japanese, both of her parents were American-born, and she was being blamed for the Pearl Harbor attack. That's pretty much what was going on then, but continues to now with Asian people being blamed for this so-called China virus, which really has nothing to do with China. So anyway, um, my father's family didn't actually go into camp because they went to stay with my grandmother's relatives in Colorado, leaving their comfortable home in Los Angeles and living in a chicken coop in Denver until they could get back on their feet there because they pretty much used up all the resources to make the move. And my grandmother's family, my mother's family was a very much more colorful and less typical kind of background. My 
grandfather's uncle was a journalist in Tokyo, and people from Texas came to Japan to try to recruit people to buy land in Texas that they considered worthless swampland because they had heard that Japanese people knew how to farm swampland for rice. So my grandfather's uncle purchased 300 acres in Webster, Texas and established a farm colony, bringing over his own relatives and a lot of other people from his hometown to share crop the land. So his brother, being one of them, who was my grandfather's father, was brought to Webster, Texas and given a piece of land to farm and they needed brides for them. So another tradition of marriages was to arrange for picture brides. They basically ordered brides coming from Japan who wanted to come to America. And my great grandmother um, said that she was promised that she could come to, California, to, Los, to um, the United States, learn to speak English, get an education and be able to have a better life. Instead, they put her in a rooming house, said, you're gonna cook and clean for all the farm workers. And um, she didn't know anything about cooking or cleaning. She had been a peasant farm girl in Japan, but that's pretty much what she was left with. Not the life she was guaranteed. But on the other hand, the Onishi colony in Webster, Texas was one of several very large Japanese farm colonies, which is something that a lot of people don't know about. And they, along with a couple of other Japanese farmers, were responsible for developing the strain of rice known as Texas long grain, which is still being produced to this day. They eventually grew to a colony of 1,000 people and 3,000 acres with their own company store and people from all over the world immigrating as sharecroppers, including people from Germany and Russia. So my great grandmother said she learned how to speak German and Russian and Spanish before she learned how to speak English. But um, her husband was murdered on the farm and um, there was some potential that she was implicated in it because she left the farm with a man she was not married to and my grandfather who was at that time 11 years old and ended up in California uh, and got a job at Grand Central Market in Los Angeles in the late 1920s. She eventually married her boss who was the manager there, a Japanese American immigrant also, and uh, they bought a home in Boyle Heights the Boyle Heights area of Los Angeles, which was the other Japanese ghetto. It was actually a Jewish neighborhood that had a lot of Japanese residents due to the proximity to Little Tokyo. I want to mention that they were able to buy the house because of a precedent set forth here in Riverside by the Harada family who bought a home in 1915 in their American-born children's name, and it was determined in court that that was legal, that those children were entitled to own property as American citizens. So my great grandparents bought their home in Boyle Heights in my grandfather's name because he was born in Texas. And my grandmother on that side of the family was born in Honolulu, Hawaii to a poor family that worked on the pineapple plantations. But she was given a very rare opportunity because people from California came to recruit people to train as domestic servants. And she was trained to be a gourmet chef and employed in the home of a prominent Hollywood film director and lived in an estate in the Wilshire district of Los Angeles and saw things that she never would have seen as a poor girl from Hawaii. She got to cook for parties that included major celebrities of the time. She had her boss's friends asking her to be in their films because in the 1930s, movies about Hawaii were becoming popular. And she got to take the chauffeur-driven limousine to go out dancing um, and have a social life. But the social life was still segregated. She was not allowed to socialize with white young people in Los Angeles. So she joined the community in Little Tokyo that my grandfather was a part of as what's known as the Nisei generation, the first generation to be born in this country. And uh, that's where they met at a dance party and they got married in 1935 and my mother was born later that year and then my aunt in 1937. But then they all ended up in the same boat by the time the war, war hit as my father's family had. My mother's family actually had nowhere to go, so they went to the camps, first going to horse stalls in Santa Anita racetracks, and then to uh, Post in Arizona, then to Gila Bend, Arizona, where they were in these very crude barracks after having lived in a comfortable home that the family owned in Boyle Heights. And uh, fortunately, they didn't suffer as much as a lot of families did because they were able to rent the house in Boyle Heights to a family that actually took care of it. There were a lot of people who were sympathetic towards the Japanese because they knew them. And this is the whole point. People fear what they don't know, but a lot of people got to know my family and consider them to be close friends and help them in many ways during the war. Now, upon return from the war, um, 
both families came back to Los Angeles and settled in the West Adams and Crenshaw areas. And there were neighborhoods there that had covenants that prohibited anyone who was not white to live in those neighborhoods. And that was not lifted until Congressional Act of 1948, where those areas were opened up and they were able to move into those neighborhoods at that point. Prior to that time, there were a lot of people of African-American descent who were wealthy and celebrities and, so, and doctors who were not allowed to live in those neighborhoods either. And um, one interesting case of that was a celebrity singer, Nat King Cole, who had a lot of white audiences, wanted to buy a home in the formerly restricted area of Hancock Park in Los Angeles and received a lot of opposition from the locals telling him, well, we don't want any undesirable in our undesirables in our neighborhood. His answer to them was, well, see if I see any, I'll let you know. And such was the case with my family moving into very modest working class neighborhoods that had previously been restricted. They were not exactly welcomed in 1948 in these neighborhoods. So the experience of racism did not certainly end, but really just began after the war and what they had to do to be, find acceptance. Now, it was not until 1952 when the immigrant generation was able to apply for citizenship. And in fact, practically all people of Japanese ancestry who were immigrants at that time applied for citizenship immediately in 1952 when they were able to. And due to the efforts of that generation and uh, other, you know, to, to pick up the pieces after the war, by the time I was born in 1955, I was able to re live a life relatively free of that kind of blatant racism, yet it still existed. I grew up uh, initially in the Crenshaw area of southwestern Los Angeles, and I didn't really think about it until I looked at a class picture from my fourth grade class to realize that the class was 95% Asian American. And so we were not a minority, and I had no awareness of being a minority until later in life. By the time I was in high school and I started to go after work as an actor, uh, such as it was in high school, I found that I could not be considered for roles because I was not considered to be a regular American. I was considered to be uh, a minority and a person of color and could only play those stereotype roles. And it went even further than that because later in life, for example, I had people say to me in my choices of, of uh, romantic involvements, do you prefer people of your own type or Americans? And I said, well, I am American. And they said, no, I mean regular Americans. So like, I guess I'm irregular. And going all the way up until fairly recent years and working with children in areas that had really no Asian American presence, I'd have kids say to me things like, oh, Chinese guy, Bruce Lee, because they see me as this Asian looking face. I had one of them ask me like, what was it like growing up as a little boy in China? Now, first of all, Japan and China are about as different as France and Sweden in terms of culture. You know, they're on the same part of the world, but not culturally similar, different languages, different culture. Secondly, I knew nothing about really the culture of Japan or China because I was born and raised in Los Angeles from parents who were both born in Los Angeles and other than during the war raised in Los Angeles. So for all I knew, I was just an American kid and it hit me pretty hard to be realized that I was going to be singled out as different. Um, but at some point I took pride in that and got involved in advocacy work. In the 80s, I was heavily involved in advocacy work for Asian Americans in the entertainment industry. And there's an interview that I, was, that I did on cable television, uh, which is on my YouTube channel. If anybody's interested, message me and I'll send you the link. I was interviewed in 1988 to speak on the work I was doing as a casting director in advocacy towards Asians and other people of color in what they called colorblind casting, which is in a role that's not specifically ethnic of any kind, casting people who are not white. And hopefully that trend has continued. Um, I like to think that things that I've done have had a lasting effect that will move on beyond my lifetime. And yet it's so frustrating to realize that at this point in time, in the year 2020, we are still dealing with raci racism that comes from ignorance, from people not knowing that people of color are just as American as anyone else. I have met a lot of people who thought of me as being foreign and when in fact my family had been in this country far longer than theirs had. So the thing that we have to be aware of is that we are all in this together as Americans, that we need to join together to fight ignorance and to fight racism. And the way to do that is to really get to know each other's stories. And that's why I was really wanting to share my family's story here in the hope that 
this will make people see that we are as American as anybody in this country and deserve to be treated as such. So uh, I mentioned, it was mentioned in, in my introduction that I had chosen the song that I was going to perform as special music for this service. The song is an old hippie song from the 60s, which is my era of music anyway. And I was going to just sing it live, but technically there were complications that would have made it easier for me to make a video of me singing the song. But then I realized that if, for me, just being on camera singing the song wouldn't be as interesting and I could do something more. So I created a video with some images. And so as this video plays, feel free to sing along with it if you know the song. But most importantly, think about what these lyrics really mean, because they are just as relevant now as they were in 1969 when the song was popular. So um, let's have the video now and then I'll specifically. You hold the key to love and fear. Just one key unlocks them both. It's there at your command. The key to love is understanding. Understanding and knowing your fellow Americans. Fear comes from ignorance. It's your choice. So I hope that you'll make the choice of love rather than fear because you hold the key. Thank you. And I will be available for questions afterwards, but I'll turn the service over now back to Grace. Thank you very much, Steve. Our closing hymn is We'll Build a Land. Please rise in spirit and join us.
benediction, please close your eyes and reach out to each other in your thoughts. Feel the connection between us, the interconnected web, joining us as a community, a church family. Our benediction is, share your glorious light with the world by James Morrison. Within each of our hearts, there is a most glorious light. Go forth and let it spark help you understand what troubles both you and others. Go forth and let its light of reason be a guide in your decisions. Go forth and bring its ray of hope to those in need of help in both body and spirit, that they may find healing. Go forth and fan the flames of passion to help heal our world. Go forth and spread the warm glow of love, pushing back the darkness of the world. Go forth and share your glorious light with the world. Amen, shalom, and blessed be. Thank you for the great sermon, Steve. Thank you, Steve. That was Thank very good. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed that. Well, hope that you know, people, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the Japanese experience was, particularly in this country, so I hope that clarified some of it. I was really glad to hear your personal stories. That was a very nice part of it for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, my own yeah. Go ahead, Steve. I also liked your music. Oh, As she, so. <laughs> that song is a favorite at my church in Nebraska, too. <laughs> oh, really? We, you know, the, so, song was, the song was so yeah. overplayed at one time that people didn't want to hear it anymore, but now <laughs> it, I think we need it again. Yeah. We need all oh, no, of Listening to you singing it immediately brought me back to my last church. That's so sweet. <laughs> Thank you well, for opening up, too. That, that takes a lot of willingness to put yourself out there. So thank you. Well, and I've been doing that for years, even going back to the 80s when I was doing a lot of advocacy work for ethnic stuff at that time, I had to pretty much tell what my story was. But also there was the frustration that I was dealing with, with um, kind of racism that I wasn't expecting that I was experiencing during that time in my life. And I, I've reached a point now at this age of, of acceptance of a lot of that stuff, but now what do I do with it? <laughs> you pass it on. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully. And, you know, truthfully, there's very few full-blooded Japanese people in the current generation. I mean, my sister's children were both half Japanese, and then their children now are quarter Japanese. Though my, uh, my niece actually married a Hispanic guy, so her children are one quarter Japanese, one quarter white, and 50% Mexican, which is kind of nice. <laughs> And interestingly, my nephew's wife has a sister who married a guy who was full blooded Japanese. So their children have cousins who are more Asian than they are. So it's interesting how that all worked out. I, I often wonder how all this multicultural combinations are going to hold up against racism now because we're all mixed now. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of gentrification. And yet interestingly, the younger generations are interested in their ancestry. My sister had no interest in, in our Japanese heritage, but her children do. And they're asking me, and my sister said, good thing you, you know, learned about this stuff because she didn't have anything to pass on to them particularly. Okay. And so I did, and they were very interested. We have a family crest, which we have because my family name comes from the, a line of samurai of Japan, who are the only, and people only of certain classes had um, a family crest, but ours was upside down because we were disgraced because the samurai 
and my ancestry was defeated but didn't kill himself so they had to become peasant class after that but my nephew had his the, the family crest tattooed on his his arm <laughs> and he's a graphic artist and he created a, a version of that um family he crest tattooed right set up for upside down huh did he tattoo it right side up or upside down upside down but you can't <laughs> tell it's an abstract wisteria flower because the name fuji fuji means wisteria Fujinami, which is my family name, means something like a whole bunch of waves of wisteria or something like that. So um, you, can't, you can't tell if the flower is upside down or right set up when it's abstract and you, you don't know Japanese. Uh, There's a metaphor anyway. in there somewhere, Steve. Huh? <laughs> There's a metaphor in there somewhere. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm glad my ancestor didn't kill himself because I might not be here but, uh, now otherwise. <laughs> But, you know, another side of it is not only racism, but what existed, the kind of discrimination in a lot of countries, but especially in the Asian countries, class discrimination. If you were born into a peasant class in Japan in the 1800s, there was no way you could rise above it. You could not do anything, no matter what you did, to become higher class. What's interesting, though, is that my um, grandfather's uncle was a journalist in Tokyo and was not of peasant class, and yet he chose to buy land in Texas and start a farm. Uh, and pretty much went broke doing that. He ended up, uh, after World War I, moving to Boston and becoming a journalist there as a correspondent between American and Japanese press. I don't know what happened to him during the war because we were pretty much cut off from that part of the family after my great-grandfather was murdered. We did get in touch with that side of the family later on, and they believed that my great-grandmother was having an affair with, I don't want to say this as part of the service, but it, you know, I, I'm actually making this public anyway, as, as I tell my family story, that they believed that she was having an affair with one of the farm workers and they killed her husband thinking that they'd get the farm and the money. And in fact, he didn't own the farm and there wasn't any money. And uh, she said they took the farm. They said she took what she'd get her hands on and took off. And so I don't know wow. what the truth was because she wouldn't talk about it. You know, my grandfather wouldn't talk about it. Nobody else knew what happened. My grandfather, though, was a little year old boy watch, uh, discovering his father's body dead at the front door was traumatized seriously by that. He was traumatized by his entire childhood at the Texas farms. Like he would not eat chicken for the rest of his life because he watched them chop the heads off of them to, to, to butcher them uh, on the farm there. So that's what they did then. And certainly seeing your father murdered, he, it was like one of those things where his memory blanked out that part of the experience because he was the only one in the house at the time his father was shot. It was like somebody knocked on the door, he, the, my great grandfather opened the door and somebody went bang and shot him at the door with a shotgun right there. Um, now in 1921 in Texas in a rural area, nobody cared about a Japanese sharecropper farmer being murdered, so there wasn't much of an investigation. But probably was one of the farmhands that my great grandmother probably was having an affair with and they took off very quickly after that. I, like oh, a, yeah, I intended like you've to got write a, a great biographical novel there. <laughs> oh yeah, I, well I, I had actually developed this treatment for a screenplay and I was showing it to people and nobody believed that it was a true story, uh, but it was. And a, a lot of other interesting things too. My grandmother had some incredible experiences working as a domestic servant in Hollywood that you know, gave her some glamour and excitement in her life that she wouldn't have had otherwise and that she really developed a taste for. So she didn't have any interest in ever going back to Hawaii or being Hawaiian anymore. She was a Los Angeles person all the way. And, you know, so for her and for my grandfather, who was educated, he had a college education. And I don't know how they did it, but my great grandmother somehow got the man she married to pay for putting my grandfather through USC in 1931 when there was a serious depression. Most people didn't have money to eat and they owned a house and were able to put their son through USC uh, to be a, become a pharmacist. He actually got, got my grandmother pregnant and had to drop out of college before he finished. So he did, they, they were blamed for and a lot of juicy stories in my family, you know, yeah. that are not typical of Japanese American families. Um, on my mother's side, at least. My father's side, as I said, was very typical. They were just laborers. My grandfather became a gardener and actually did pretty well. About, oh, yeah, sure. I have a question about the topic of the sermon, if you want me to ask. Oh, sure, sure. Um, so this I... This is supposed to be questions, not me talking, so please. <laughs> I, I, it sounded like you were you were just filling time uh, with, with stories, waiting for someone to, to, to ask a question. So okay. I thought I'd jump in. Um, if you want to keep going, then go ahead. No, no, um, no. I want the questions. So uh, before uh, the coronavirus thing, which again, uh, it's it's completely unsurprising, uh, unfortunately to me, that that the terminology 
uh, Chinese virus was was chosen by by uh, conservative people to at, at to, to mock and to generate uh, uh, those specific types of people. And so, but before that, uh, what I saw in, uh, observed in particular was uh, East Asian people in particular, uh, a lot of uh, mostly Japanese and Chinese people would be held up uh, by white people as sort of this model token minority to other minorities to say, these are people who uh, overcame oppression and they're, and they're successful. Uh, and so therefore, there's no reason why uh, a Latino or a black person shouldn't already be successful, which of course, is starting with that this assumption that uh, that all of that all people who aren't white were start from a highly disadvantaged place uh, inherently. Um, but uh, I this is a very, it's a very opening ended question. If you well, just want yeah. to you know, comment on it, um, personal experience, it but is also reverse, I, uh, reverse if you want to also address a uh, sorry one quick uh, and a leading question, uh, maybe if this has anything to do with the fact that those. Uh, countries currently support uh, heavily authoritarian governments? Well, of course, you have to understand that there's been a whole wave of new, more recent immigration, the refugees from Southeast Asia and so forth, and um, they have a whole different kind of sense of, of connection with their mother country than those families that immigrated earlier who left because they're leaving something fairly terrible for a better life and really didn't want to look back at all. But interesting, this thing about reverse discrimination, because um, so there is something inherent, I think, in people of Asian cultures to just work their butts off to get ahead in life. And I saw that in my family. And it led to a lot of people of my generation becoming model students, being straight A, studious, book nerd type people. And I wasn't that. And it was expected of me. And so people looked at me and go, you're a slacker. You're not like, like all, most Asian people are, are, are A students. And, they're, and I um, actually do have a genius level IQ, but I was not intellectually motivated and I did not pursue the intellectual path and I'm not good at math, I'm not good at science and I'm not good at taking pictures and all those stereotypes that, that come forth. So that's a kind of reverse discrimination that laid an expectation on me that I couldn't live up to. But at the same time, um, yeah, it did, it did create a stigma because there was some resentment from other minorities that, that thought that we were trying to be better than them, which was not the case at all. Um, my grandfather was a gardener, worked six days a week, 12 hours a day to be able to make a living for himself and for the family. And had he not done that, I couldn't have been the slacker that I was, you know, because um, there wouldn't have been stability in my family's finances. My father was an auto mechanic, a blue collar worker, wage earner, and we struggled. My dad had me totally convinced we were poor, but we had a roof over our head and food to eat. And they owned a house in a suburban neighborhood that is now worth $700,000. So I mean, we weren't exactly poor, uh, yet we weren't, you know, these model minority that a lot of people think that Asians are all either. But the bottom line is you can't take any group of people and say, all these people are like this, you know? You can't say all black people are this and all Mexican people are this, and all Asian people are this and all gay people are this because everybody's individual. And that's what's important to understand is that each individual needs to be looked at as an individual for who that person is and not the group they represent. And yes, there will be certain characteristics that will come forth from the group that they come from that may be passed on, but that doesn't define who the person is. And I don't want to be defined as you're Asian, therefore you are this because I don't fit the stereotypes. And that's why I couldn't work much as an actor. I didn't fit the stereotypes, couldn't speak with an accent, didn't know martial arts, didn't speak any foreign languages, limited me a lot in that respect. And I had to learn how to speak with an accent and be trained in it because I needed to be able to do that. I didn't know how, you know? So um, yeah. Uh, does that, did I answer your question or did I, did I like get off on a tangent? No, I just, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about it, yeah. Okay, now another thing is that this is not the first instance in recent years of Asians being under attack for something. About 15 years, maybe 20 years ago, there was a Chinese American guy in, the, in Michigan who was attacked because he was being blamed by auto workers who were unemployed for the fact that they were unemployed because of the Japanese auto industry. Now, a Chinese American college student in Michigan has nothing to do with the Japanese auto industry taking, you know, having such a presence and putting a lot of auto workers out of work. In fact, I bet you there were a lot of 
Asian American people working in the Detroit auto industry that got laid off just as well as everybody else. Because the point is, as Americans, we suffer just as much for everything that all other Americans do. We're suffering as much for the coronavirus as anybody in America. We suffered as much for the unemployment caused by the Japanese auto companies as any Americans have. We didn't cause it, you know. So, but yet we get blamed for it by by association, and that is the biggest danger of racism. Yvonne, do you have something to say? No, she was just saying she always drove a Japanese car. I said, I, I take responsibility. I've always had a foreign car, mostly Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? My dad uh -oh. always drove, she my dad only drove Chevys. He didn't like anything but Chevys, so. I, I come from a long line of Henry Fords, so, and none of us in my family have ever bought a Ford. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to blame anybody for the decline of the American auto industry, blame American car buyers because they bought the things, right? Yep. That's right. Yeah, I've always bought Japanese cars, and I like them. See. And well, and they're better constructed. That's all there is to it. Better American cars are much better now than what they used to be. But it, I mean, it. I I remember when I lived in Detroit, and I all and I bought Hondas and Volkswagens. And I would get this argument, and I was always threatened with your car is going to be, you know, damaged because. And, oh. and um, I mean, it was a real bad argument back then, and a serious argument. And, you know, my answer was always, if you want me to buy your car, make something I want to buy. <laughs> you know? uh, I guess in Detroit, though, you'd be under pressure that other people wouldn't be. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, the other thing beyond that, the reason why... Jap American cars are better because they started using the Japanese te technology of just in time and all the manufacturing practices that, that made the car A, a good car, and B, cheaper. So, you know. But also, there, there was a point when Mazdas were considered American cars because they were assembled in America and, and Fords were considered foreign cars because they were assembled in Canada. So, you know, it's all mixed up now anyway. Dinah, were you going to say something? For a long time. Dinah, you are muted. Dinah, you're muted. The host has to unmute because you can't do it. Yeah, if you have to unmute yourself. If you ever re-mute yourself, you won't be able to unmute. The host has to unmute you. It's pretty annoying. Shame on you, Adam. Adam, there she goes. I was wondering about Reverend Mabon. Do you have any comments? We've we've seen your lovely face there and watching and listening and and yeah. what are your comments might as well unmute everybody now but yes i'd be interested in your comments very much i tried to unmute <clears throat> uh, steve i sent you uh the information of my contact i'd love to on behalf of the human relations commission and my involvement in the community to learn so much more um you know, it, it, it's amazing that something that i've been dealing with trying to understand and comprehend why people hate and all too often I realize what's going on in the current day, but time and time again, we seem to forget that there are others who have been discriminated and abused. And if we can come together and collaboratively work towards making this place a better place to put more emphasis on humanitarian efforts, I, I'm all for that. And I'd love, I mean, your presentation really moved me this morning and gave me a lot of insight and opened my eyes to another dimension. So thank you. Well, thank you. And there's a lot of unity happening now between people of color because of need to. Uh, yet I, my fear is that there will be a tendency to segregate from white people. And that's not the right thing. We need to all be Americans together. We're in this together. I'm working with two people uh, in creating something in my property in Joshua Tree. One of them is a Mexican-American woman who runs a nonprofit for uh, foster children and, <coughs> and has a degree in social work. The other is an African-American man who coincidentally is the son of a celebrity. His father was one of the founding members of Earth, Wind and Fire, but he is involved in, in alternative education. And the three of us are working together to try to create an entity that will present a uni unified front of, we are all in this together and we need to work together. Um, uh, Steve, I'd love to, to join in that collaboration and do whatever I can. Interesting love to have enough, you join, yes. I, I've been out in that area. Interestingly enough, I, I have a client who is a, the daughter of a celebrity, none other than James Brown, 
who has experienced oh, wow. some, some issues out in that area. So we have a lot in common. I would definitely love, you would have my support and involvement in anything towards that effort. I, I put my phone number and email uh, in the chat for you. Um, okay. I look forward to hearing um, from you. I think there's a way that I can save this whole chat into my computer. So, but I'd love that collaboration. Uh, fortunately, my family is a multi-ethnic. When we have our family reunion, it's like uh, a meeting of the United Nations. <laughs> Very good. So, you know, well, so, my, so is my family, because as I mentioned, you know, we have a whole Mexican-American part of the family that through my, my nieces. Uh, exactly. And, I, I, I have uh, uh, family members who constantly remind me that white is a color as well. So when you talk about colored people, you're talking about all people. I share the pains of a niece that, that wonders and come to me for consolation to try and figure out. She says, I don't fit in the Latino community. I don't fit in a black community. Where am yeah. I? Uh, yeah. Family members who are, 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 are as white as white can be. And uh, they come to me and says, I don't understand. So we all have a part to play. Yeah, I think that that is an issue with, uh, with children of mixed ancestry now, that they're still being looked at as, what are you? You're not this and you're not that. And there seems to be something in human nature that wants to categorize people and make them one thing or another so that they can understand it. And people are not one thing or another. They are all these things, and there's a whole spectrum, you know? Correct. Um, you know, I've heard that I, exact I, story our from very, Our very language, black and white, categorizes us as on these opposite ends. And I always, now and then when I get into these discussions, I say, this is white, okay? I am not white. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, if you really think about it, our language, the way we talk about this, uh, and we don't have words that, that replace it readily. Oh, you but, know what's really bad? Our, our words um, put us at opposite ends of the continuum. And it's, it, it drives me crazy. I'm, in recent I'm, years, yeah, in recent years, we've had this issue about gender identity. So we have him, his, her, she. We don't actually have a word that's gender neutral. People use they, them, but that's plural. That refers to more than one person. Yeah. Uh, well, the they has we, been used as a singular in English for over 500 years. Well, but it really isn't by definition. And when people say- But it say, is by, by definition. It's in the dictionary as a singular noun. The thing uh, is, as a singular that, that pronoun. What we, and it has what we been actually have as a singular pronoun is it, which is something that we use with No, no, no. It's, it's in there as they is a singular pronoun in the dictionary. Yeah, and has well, been I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's not accepted in common uses of the proper I'm English sorry, language. but it- and so, But it is. Um, so I refuse to acknowledge it. But anyway, I'm not going to get an argument about that. The point is that we have these uh, specific you know, pronouns that are just like black and white and not, and you know, everything is a spectrum. You don't have to argue with me, just don't lie. I think well, we, have, and then, know, we, you know, we all have our truth, so I'm not going to try to change anybody's mind about anything. No, 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 the dictionary it. says like. Yeah, okay, okay, let's, let's drop that because there's yeah. no point in discussing it. You're not going to change my mind, I'm going to change yours, no point in talking about it. But see, here we go, you know, a lot of, a lot of acceptance is a matter of accepting differences and allowing for them. Um, allowing for people who don't agree with you to be who they are and leave that be and not feel the need to oppress them or change them. Dinah. You... I think Pat had a... Excuse me, Pat I did. and Hannah. I did. Yes, yes, I would like to talk. Um, I and think it's I... really important that we honor differences. And the thing that just happened between Steve and Alex, hi Alex, I don't know you, but I know Steve. Um, that happens you know we um we have just really strong as humans we we just we want to be right <laughs> <laughs> and i just think it's really important that um as unitarians we acknowledge that we're all, as, as everybody said we're all in this together but particularly at this time i think it's so important that we honor the differences you know people just see things differently and they get to so thanks, that's all I want to say. And oh, yeah, Steve, I, I, I loved your thing. Oh, and thanks. Steve, I have lots of questions. Um, what is your personal experience with racism, discrimination, you know, because of your being Japanese? Yeah, uh, it isn't really as overt as it may have been for older generations, yet I have been called Jap, I've been called Chink, I've been called- Really? You know? all those things. Um, 
by ignorant people who don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, but uh, in what context? I mean, somebody walks up to you and says a slur like that. Yep, just walking down the street, I've gotten that. Sometimes from people who are not even who didn't even speak English, except for those kinds of words. So, can I say something? Yeah. So when I was in elementary school, nobody messed with me because they thought I all knew karate. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten away with that one too. You know, all you gotta do is make some funny uh, noises, and they, they're scared away because they think <laughs> they 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 this next one of martial arts. Um, I've had them call me Jackie Chan too, and I was like, yeah, I wish I had his money and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And his martial arts skills, for that matter, but I don't. I, I took I, I took a, a class in karate uh, and did so poorly that I dropped out of it when I was a teenager. Yeah. I took classes in Japanese language. The only F I got in college was a Japanese language class. <laughs> so, you know. Konnichiwa. Yeah, so much for, <laughs> I know how to order food and ask for the bathroom, and that's what you need to know in most languages. <laughs> But uh, no, to answer your question, I didn't experience racism directly so much except in the arenas of working as an actor um, where my options were so limited. I was limited to playing ethnic character roles for the most part or little nondescript, nothing parts where they didn't care who played them. And mm. those were mostly the ones I did because they didn't fit the stereotypes. So I didn't work very much. And um, I think opportunities are maybe better now that but you know, I've been out of the business for so long trying to re-enter it. I'm kind of starting from scratch. And so I'm doing other things like producing videos and stuff. Um, but I want to say something about the idea of about being right, because it's not a matter of being right. People hold to what they believe and should not be convinced otherwise. I've had discussions with people in this church who are atheists trying to tell me that I need to prove to them that there is a God. Well, I don't, I'm not going to try to prove to anybody that there's a God. If you want to believe that there is one or if there isn't, that's not up to me. It's an individual sort of thing. And there's no point in arguing it because for me, there is a God for them. There is not. And we got to be okay with that. I think that we are a model as Unitarians of um, acceptance of differences. It's, it's in our principles. John. Did Hannah ever get to speak? Yeah, I want to speak. I'm trying oh. to speak. Did you want um, to? Hannah's still muted. Uh, still want to? No, she didn't. Probably you're, still you're stuff muted. that we can't unmute ourselves if we Adam, ever get muted. Can you unmute her? But John Longfield wants to say something. He's not muted. muted. Can you unmute everybody? Go <laughs> for it, John. Well, even if you unmute everybody, you still can't unmute yourself. Kate is still you. muted, too. I feel like, yeah, uh, I, feel like I clicked on mute for every two or three times. John, go ahead. But I'll do it again. Dine is correct. We should go to um, the other. But why don't you go ahead and say what you were going to say? Because you waited so long. Um, yeah. Not to belabor an issue, but about pronouns, you're both correct in the sense that English does not have a non-plural gender, non-specific term the way many other languages do. So we do use they that way, although it is grammatically typically used, it is filling in the gap that we otherwise have not filled in with any other term. So yes, you're both correct that it is... It's technically generally used as plural, but it is colloquially used as gender non-specific. I just wanted to make that distinction because both and, are correct. But uh, thank you. But just you know, one thing I just thought of, now I don't know a lot about the Japanese language, but I didn't know some things, and the Japanese language has got even more gender specific things. When you're counting items or when you're, uh, you know, a lot of things, they're gender specific. The, the word like I, speaking about yourself, doesn't exist. You are boku or watakushi, which is masculine or feminine. Although that's slurred a lot. My grandmother used the word boku, which is actually masculine when referring to herself. Um, but then she, and, and then like, if you say boku tachi, that means me and these other people. My grandmother said me tachi. That's like the <laughs> English, you know? So, and, and, and that's and, the whole thing. What, what, what Japanese I do learn is either Japanese baby talk or bastardized so badly, or it's Victorian Japanese. <laughs> Japanese people of, and, and <laughs> Grace, you probably have heard this too. 
people who come from ancestors who came over at a certain time refer to the bathroom as the benjo. Uh -huh. Well, a benjo, a benjo is like something more like an outhouse. It's a pit in the, you know, outside, not a flush toilet. They have another word for that, but that wasn't invented yet when our ancestors came over, right? So if we say benjo to somebody from Japan, they just laugh hysterically. <laughs> but it's common. I grew up hearing that all the time. And, right? and Steve, what, what you probably don't realize is I was about to agree with you uh, that their thing is that there is a word in English that you, that they does mean singular. And the problem is that it's not in common usage systematically by people who don't want to address uh, people who want to use that as their pronoun. Well, it's being used now, so we don't have a choice. Um, but anyway. No, you uh, don't. Yeah, Grace, when, was, when did your family immigrate? Um, so my, my father was born here. So he's, he's American, uh, American Japanese, I guess. And my mom came over I think in the 60s. Oh. Was your father's, were your father's parents born here too? Um, no, my father's parents were born in Japan. Oh. And then I think they immigrated over here as farmers. I think. I'm, I'm not quite clear on that. But. So well, I, I thought there was a lot of immigration um, just prior to the war, but there was that immigration, that, that Asian Exclusion Act in 1924 and the fact was there was very little immigration from Japan after 1924 and through the 1930s. There were only certain circumstances they could come over, like they had relatives already here that they needed to join, or they were coming over to do a specific job that was already set up for them. Right. So I wonder if your, your grandparents were those who came over during that time under those special conditions, because I don't think it was until the 50s that Japanese immigration was freely allowed again. And a lot of them came over at that time, too. I have an aunt who came over in 1956. Right. And um, actually... Uh, that aunt also is connected with some kind of famous people. Her cousin is an actor who was, went by the name of Mako and worked quite a lot oh, in this country. Right, right. He, was, he was born in Japan, but he is her first cousin that they grew up together. And his parents came over during the 1930s because his father worked uh, for the American government uh -huh. as a, an emissary of some sort and a translator. And he was also a prominent artist. They wrote a lot of children's books, that, including one called Crow Boy, which should be looked at because it's about bullying. Um, but it's a fictional story set in Japan of his childhood and uh, was pretty well known. I, I, I saw it in school libraries when I was a kid, and it's still in school libraries now. Mm -hmm. so, so you know a relative of Mako? I am a relative of Mako by marriage. Yeah. Wow, that's insane. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that was, that's, they're not blood relatives, so I didn't talk about it, but that had a really, that part of the family had a really interesting history that's very not typical at all. And he's played so many parts in, in film that are just completely across the board, you know? Yeah, well, you yeah, know, a lot of Asian actors did. do this after we join chat time, because we are, we are running way over chat time. <laughs> time. We are, and so we can all your... continue this discussion in chat time where other people will join us. Okay. John, I would like to say something though. Please give him the chance. He has been trying for quite okay. some time. Yeah. Who? Who? John. John Longfield. Well, John, you need to be assertive, John. Like when? Yeah, How? Well, he, was, he was trying to be. <laughs> he was trying. What am I supposed to do? Slam my hands on the desk and throw my chair? That's right. right. Yep. Yep. Go ahead, John. Hurry. We got to go. We have to start, huh? I, was, I had numerous <laughs> conversations with Steve before chat time about this subject. Um, my brother's wife's parents were put in one of the camps up in Northern California, and that's where they met and got married. So we've had lots of conversations about that. They've lost everything. Um, a few years ago, when the government offered them uh, reparations for stuff they've lost, he told them where they could take the money and show. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. He, yeah, he's written no, numerous Is books. Okay? He's written numerous books on the subject. Um, Robin tells me that in Los Angeles, there's a humongous section in the Evergreen Cemetery of Japanese. I don't know if back then um, they had their own separate section in the cemeteries. And there's also a humongous monument for Japanese people that had helped out during World War II. In Little Tokyo. And, uh, it's in Little Tokyo. She said it's in Little Tokyo. And her, um, my brother's wife's dad was actually an interrogator during the war. He had to interrogate the prisoners. And my dad had a, he had a collection. He collected uh, things, figurines called Occupy Japan. 
after the war, mm -hmm. Americans didn't want to buy stuff that was made in Japan. So they had to stamp it with occupied Japan. So they knew when it came from Japan, it came from the part that the Americans occupied. Otherwise, we weren't going to buy from Japan. And also, there's a house on Lemon Street, about three blocks down from our church. So it's uh, um, a landmark, the Serhada House. A landmark decision was made that allowed Japanese to own property. They weren't allowed after the war. We weren't going to let them own property at all there. Um, and so this went all the way to the Supreme Court. It was before the war, Derek. That okay, she's brought. saying before the war, but in any case, it was a Supreme Court decision. So um, anyway, I wanted to get that out there as part of the service, and you can continue to chat time if you want. Yeah. Okay, John. Okay, so I guess we're all going to go to chat time. I hope I got the link, but I guess it'll be in my email, right? Because I registered for it. I heard you yelling. Oh. Yeah, and, uh, if you yeah. registered for it, um, it'll be in your email. Okay. Well, I guess I'll, that you did. I, I saw your email there, so it, it went to you. Okay. Well, I guess I'll see you guys at chat time then. I was going to go home and do it, but I'm here now and it's time, so I'll just do it from here. Right. Okay. See you guys there. Uh, all right. Reverend Maybon, are you still there? Hey, John. Uh, if it helps, then. Uh, for next time on my screen when I've got everybody in the little tiles when you when you talk and your microphone hears you your your box lights up so uh, if you talk then at least I can tell that you're trying to get a word in and I, and then I would know uh, I don't know if anyone else will notice but if if you, if you talk and your box lights up then I'll, then I'll know that you're trying to talk and then I'll I'll listen to you well, Eric, it now, so. If you start talking, it usually kind of cuts off the person who is talking, so people can hear you. You you just say, just start talking. People. Will... <laughs> All right. I mean, Bye.